Um, I'm Jan Christoph Wolchert, and uh, I'm going to tell you today about um, how to achieve freedom from the works monopolies and why that is so important. So, um, yeah, that's me. Basically, I am a designer, I'm a gone nerd. Uh, so, uh, through working with uh, the Unlisted Movement and uh, on the web, um, I've become more and more technical. So, this talk is also going to be a bit more technical, or in parts more technical. But um, I'm basically there to ensure that everything is also usable and uh, user friendly. So, the thing is, I love the web, and uh, we love the web, and I hope you also do. Um, but the problem is uh, that in recent years, um, there have been proprietary platforms uh, which um, form new layers on top of it. Um, I censored them to not advertise, but uh, I guess you know what I'm talking about. So, we need to rise up against them because they, they, want, to, they want to change our web, that, the, the way that it works. And um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit annoying um, to have your data all in one company or to have that, that a company has all the data of, a, of many different people. So, we want to change the internet architecture fundamentally. So, also, slay the dragons that um, yeah, uh, endanger our freedom and uh, take back control um, and give it back to the people. So let me tell you a bit about software evolution and uh, why we do this and, and how the current situation is and what the bad thing about it is. So <clears throat> basically, uh, there are in, in computing or in software, there are applications and then there's your data, your documents, your, your files, your images, your music, and um, back in the old days, it's all on your desktop, right? It's on your computer, you know where it is. It's, it's all on your desktop. It's, you have your data there, you have your applications there, and um, all the different applications, if there are different text editors and different photo applications, they can all get to the same data. And uh, they, they, they all use that data, and they are just the logic, they're just the application. And your data is always in your home folder or whatever it's called. And yeah, that was on the desktop, so there you knew where your data was. But nowadays, on the web, the situation is much different. Your data is at the application. So there is a document editor, an online image viewer, a music app, and they have your data, right? You need to get a new account at that app, get a new account at the image viewer or an image app, get a new account at the music player, and so on and so on. You have lots of different path, different passwords, different accounts, and um, it's really annoying, frankly. Um, and um, yeah, also they're not available everywhere. They're not available offline, and uh, it's just a hassle to, to use it. But on the positive side, actually, you, you're able to use it from pretty much any device, right? You can use it from your desktop, from your laptop, from your mobile phone, basically. You can use it from every device with a browser. So that's pretty amazing, right? That's, that's a positive point. But basically, that's the only positive thing, right? Because your data is uh, fragmented uh, over all these different apps. And uh, say you, want, you have an image viewer and you found another neat image editing app, you need to download your photos, you need to upload it again, and it's just a really too much of a hassle. So we, we thought we need to get to the rescue there, and uh, what we want to do is um, fundamentally change this model of the package deal of the app and the storage, in that you have your own separated storage from the application, right? So you have basically your home folder on the web. That, that storage, your data is somewhere online with a provider you trust, you choose, maybe on your own server, maybe on your own computer, but it's in one location that you trust, that's the point. And it's separated from the apps, from the web apps. And then, when you get to an app, it's loaded in your browser or it's cached, whatever as web apps do. And then, you say, hey, I'm whatever, young at mydata.com or something. Then, the data gets loaded into the application. So the data and the app only meet in your browser. 
So the app knows nothing about my data because it's pure logic. It's just like on the desktop, right? So um, it's just a, it's just a hollow shell, so to say, for your data as it should be. And then if I log off, the app doesn't know anything about my data, and the data is synced to my storage. And um, yeah, that's pretty mind blowing, right? So how do we do that? Right? It's, it's it sounds pretty interesting and it sounds pretty good. And there are two main components to this. One component is JavaScript. Right? There's a lot of hate going on in the free software community or in the hacker community about JavaScript. And um, I think JavaScript, or we think JavaScript is the future of free software on the web. Right? Because PHP applications, Python applications, any server-side application you can't control because it runs on a server that is not under your control, except if you host it yourself, but about 1 to 5% of people do that, hosting themselves. So, since JavaScript runs on your own machine, you can inspect it even when it's proprietary, right? It doesn't even need to be freely licensed, so you can, so you can inspect it. And um, it also enables people to, yeah, to not need infrastructure. Right, because it's all static files, it's all JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. You can host it anywhere. You can host it on whatever, on your own server, on your GitHub pages, on your Dropbox even. It's, there's loads of uh, commodity infrastructure where you can get apps out there and get people to use them. <coughs> so it's really easy to, to write and publish apps with JavaScript and HTML. You don't need a server side, you don't need a backend, right? So then, how does it work with the data? That's where the, the second component comes in. And that's what we call remote storage. So that's basically your one home folder on the web. It's um, any server that you could imagine. It's, it's a, basically remote storage is a, it's a, it's a protocol. And um, so it's a, we aim to make it a web standard. It's on the W3C wiki. It's not a web standard yet. But we aim to make it so. So it's basically similar to local storage, if you know that. Local storage is a database in the browser. And what remote storage basically does is just sync local storage, right? It's as simple as that. And um, so it's, it's a standard, it's a, it's a protocol that is comprised of different other open protocols, four of them. So one is Webfinger. Webfinger is basically um, a thing that identifies or a system that identifies a person via the scheme user at provider or user at host. For instance, your email address, whatever. Uh, your name at yourlastname.com or your name at gmail.com or whatever you choose. So that's the one identifier. For instance, Diaspora also uses it with username at joindiaspora.com to identify people and to let others communicate with each other. So that's how you say, hey, I'm me at my storage. So you say that in the app. Then we have, for the security and the authorization, we use OAuth, OAuth2, um, so that your data is safe and secure uh, and not everyone can, uh, can get to it, right? So it's exactly like Twitter does it. Twitter apps, uh, when you log in with Twitter on an app, then you're redirected to Twitter, then you need to say, yeah, uh, that's me, I'm logged in, and I want that app to use my Twitter account. And you just confirm it, that's all. And then, the first um, weird thing that you might not know uh, is uh, CORS, it's cross-origin resource sharing. You might know the same origin policy that restricts apps from, uh, from accessing, from, from doing cross-origin Ajax calls to other, to other web apps. So that's basically a header on the storage that um, yeah, circumvents that restriction. Because nowadays that restriction isn't of much use anymore. So that basically enables the app on one domain to call to the storage on the other domain and um, get the data. And uh, then there's simple get, put, delete um, calls to sync to a key value store. So it's a very simple system. That's, that's all that remote storage is, basically. And this is all that the server has to implement. And there are already um, some projects that implement it. Uh, I'll come to that later. On the developer side, or on the web app developer side, 
there is a remote storage.js. It's a client-side library. You basically just take it, put it in your app, in your local storage app, then you change something, and then it just works. Right? It adds this connector to the app. So whatever, on the top right, there will be this thing, and there you will be able to authenticate or to say, hey, I'm young at mydata.com, then I connect, then I'm redirected to the app, and then my data is in the app. So let's let's do it on this on this schema again. So you're you're you want to use your data with an app. You have your remote storage, your one location where all your data is, your documents, your images, your music, and all the apps are HTML5 and JavaScript. So then when you go to an app with your browser, you, you go to the app, you uh, it gets loaded into the browser because it's all HTML5 and JavaScript, it can be loaded and cached by an app cache. So it's basically a desktop app as of then. So when you even when you don't have Wi-Fi and you pop open your computer again, and you go to that page, that app will show, right? So, because it uses app cache, and it's basically a desktop app, so there is no reason to not use it, to not use web technologies, or to say that desktop apps are more awesome than web apps. And then, <coughs> you say, hey, my data is at that storage, and specifically, that app, because it's a, a document editor, I want that app to only use my documents, right? I don't want it to see my photos or my music, it should only see my documents. And the app will also only ask for the documents because it doesn't need the photos. Then, the documents are loaded into the app, the app and the data just meet in your browser, and then it gets synced from that on all the time. If you change something, it gets synced up, and if you're on another machine as well, it also, also everything gets synced. And if you log out again, then the app knows about nothing, and your data is in your remote storage. Pretty simple, right? And pretty interesting. And if you already find that interesting, we already have some example apps. So one thing is uh, LibreDocs. So um, that's basically uh, it's a document editor, a web-based document editor that we um, that we did as a kind of a proof of concept. Uh, so it's all everything we do is free software, and this is free software as well. So you could also host it yourself. You could. Post it anywhere, it's currently on LibreDocs.org. And there you already see the connector. So I can put in my user address, Jan at 5 where 5 is a remote storage provider. Then I click connect. I'm redirected to my storage. Then it asks, hey, I want to redrive your category documents, then your contacts for sharing and collaboration and the public category. So the public category is a special category with which you can openly share stuff, just as you're uh, familiar with, with any web app. And then I just click allow, and then it redirects me back to the app, um, and um, I see my documents, you can work on them. And the app doesn't know anything about the documents, it doesn't know which documents there are, and it doesn't know the contents of the documents. So the, the documents are pulled live into my local storage, or it basically from my remote storage it gets pulled into my local storage and into the app. And it also uses local storage as a fallback. So when you're offline, you can still use the app, and everything you edit will be synced up once you come online again. So it's exactly the same as a desktop app. And then yeah. It also works collaboratively uh, because we use Etherpad, which you might know, which is collaborative free software document editor, and we basically use that to, um, yeah, for document viewing and editing. So um, we are very adamant about using already existing technologies. As with the protocols, we use existing protocols with the apps. We reuse or build upon existing apps. And uh, this essentially um, is just a document viewer, so to say, right? So there's uh, the third one is, is an ODF document, so you can even view ODF documents with it using WebODF. And then there's also PDFJS, which is able to view uh, PDF documents. So, yeah, that's basically um, an online document viewer that uses remote storage. I can also actually show it to you directly. I'll, I'll, I'll do that at the end. Um, so, um, 
that was an, an app example. We have some more apps um, and uh, lots more in the works. Um, and these are existing providers currently, or existing software packages that um, implement the standard, implement the remote storage standard. And because it's all an open standard, and um, yeah, we want people to have control of their data, it's mostly free software packages as of now. So there's OwnCloud, um, which is a, a free software uh, sort of, or a free software package to host your own data, your own music, your documents, and has integrated apps. Uh, there's a, a presentation about it tomorrow. Uh, you should get to see it if you if you don't know about it because it's a pretty great uh, software. And uh, so that when you have an OwnCloud uh, account somewhere, like an, you know, an account at an instance then you can use that account as your remote storage account. So if you are, whatever, max at ownclout.com or something, then you can use that account with LibreDocs or with any other app. You just put it into the connector, connect, you authorize the app, and then your data is in there. Or you can use the app with new data, new ideas. Uh, the second one, the second provider is uh, five apps. It's a startup from Berlin. Uh, they do uh, basically cross compilation of apps. So you write your app in HTML and JavaScript, and then you compile it to Chrome Web App, uh, to Firefox Web App, uh, Firefox extension, I mean, uh, iOS app, and Android app will come in the future. Uh, and they um, provide remote storage accounts to developers. So that's pretty cool. And we like them, and we work a lot with them. And uh, so, yeah, I totally recommend them as well. Then, <coughs> that's a, um, there's a bigger project going on right now with, uh, with uh, Surfnet, which is a um, provider of uh, or uh, support for Dutch universities, uh, tech uh, for Dutch universities. So basically, what, what we'll do with them is every uh, Dutch student, every Dutch university student, will get a remote storage account. So that's about one million students that will get an account in, I think, a month or so. Um, and so then, if you're at University of Amsterdam, you will have your name at uva.nl, and you will be able to use that as your, as your remote storage account, and use any unlisted app with that. So that's pretty amazing. And as for developers, there is a huge user base already. So basically, when you, when you, when you think about logging and, and implementing a user system, I mean, by now, it's pretty ridiculous to have your own system because uh, people need to get a new account and it's a barrier to entry, so you're not going to do that anyway. But the alternative currently is Facebook Connect. Right? So basically what remote storage is, is Facebook Connect open and way better. Um, so everyone is able to choose their own provider and um, they have their data there, they have their profile data there, whatever, their, their name, their photo, and um, you as app provider, um, you don't need to do nothing, right? So um, that's pretty awesome. And then the, the, or not the last thing, but uh, currently uh, it's called, it's PageKite. It's uh, basically um, a reverse proxy, which works similar to uh, DimDNS, or it works better than that. Uh, but basically it enables you to um, expose your local host to the web. So you can, um, have your storage on your own computer and have it online all the time when you have whatever, a desktop computer at home running all the time. And you can just use that as your storage and you will always know where your data is, right? You won't even need to trust any provider. You will only have to trust yourself. So they also support remote storage. So you, you're pretty free to choose already from any solution. So who is the people who think that is possible. <laughs> that's us, um, that's, or that's the initial people. We're, we're forming more into a movement now where basically every HTML5 and JS developer is part of the movement, where every remote storage provider is part of the movement. And, um, but this is a, a particularly funny, um, funny thing, a funny picture, because we are in a, in a small Czech city called Unhorst, which is about 20 kilometers west of Prague, and uh, we uh, celebrated our first year anniversary there uh, last September. And the plan is to do the same this year. So on the 9th of September this year, there will be an unconference uh, near Prague in Unhorst. So you're all invited. Um, 
It will be a non-conference on the free web and yeah, decentralized technologies. Um, and it's a pretty tiny town, so it's about one or two kilometers and has about 3,000 inhabitants or so. We wonder if we'll get internet there, but um, it's pretty fun. <laughs> Um, and uh, yeah, we are, we are a non-profit project, so um, we are, we're an EV in Germany, so an Eingetragener Verein, and uh, we're funded purely by donations. So we're not, um, we're not a startup, we're, I don't know what the current name is, we're, we're a non-profit startup, so to say. And um, so we're funded mainly by NLNet, which is a Dutch foundation, and they also fund stuff like WebODF or NoScript, and uh, yeah, in general, um, cool internet-related projects. So they're pretty awesome, and um, they help us a lot. Um, and they enable us to work full-time on this. And then there's DuckDuckGo. Um, they donated $1,000 or something the other month, um, and they're a pretty awesome search engine, so we have a great deal of love for them. And uh, of course, everyone, everyone like you, um, we did a, a crowdfunding campaign uh, last year, and um, every time someone donates something, they help um, keep the movement going forward. And um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Um, you can easily join the movement. You can our stuff is on GitHub. Uh, we are on Twitter, on Identica, on Diaspora, and we also have an IRC channel. If you're up for joining, um, it's easiest to come on the IRC channel. We also have a mailing list, um, and uh, yeah, just um, check that out and um, let me know or directly ask questions now. Thanks. Yeah, that's an option, but it's a pretty cumbersome one. So when you're, I don't know, when you're around somewhere, when you're, when you're at the university or at some friend's laptop, um, then it's easiest to just go online and just authenticate with your remote storage. Then you don't need to plug in the USB key and you, you don't have the chance of losing uh, your remote storage. So um, we think that because people use web apps already way more than they use desktop apps, like Facebook, for instance, or Google Mail. So, um, of course, having a USB stick with your data on it is an option for privacy and uh, for, for um, ha being in control of your data, but we think um, we want to work on a solution that works for most people. In one of the earlier slides, you showed an application asking for rights uh, for your documents and mm -hmm. your contacts. Um, is it also possible to specify, I just want you to access this maybe set of documents, what are you doing with my contacts? 
Yeah, we, um, we plan that, so to have kind of like a file picker in between, between the app and the storage. Uh, we didn't do it yet, but yeah, that's definitely um, a plan to further, um, to further make sure that apps can access the data that you don't want them to access. So, this is a technical question. Uh, how do you do the client side overall authentication? I didn't get this point. How, how we use it? it the the all authentication isn't client side, it's on the server, on the storage. So, your data is hosted on a server, and that server also has implemented OAuth. So, that's server side, that's storage side. That, that all happens on the basically done storage. Excuse me? Uh, only storage. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I have two questions. Um, first of all, um, uh, the problem is, or, or did I understand it correctly, that the application is not able to, um, or the application only runs the browser. Mm -hmm. So any application that might um, need um, higher processing power or somehow uh, need to transfer the data to the, the data to the server is not allowed in this context. Um, that's the ideal point where an app is just purely client side. So basically, the, the, the JavaScript and the HTML part is kind of optional. So if you have an app that whatever uses I think uses some server side language and stores users' data, you can also implement remote storage, right? Because it's also even if you want to store the people's data, then they should still be able to switch an app or to be in control of your data. So the client side aspect isn't like 100% mandatory. Okay, and related to that, uh, most of the online um, search um, capabilities that I use, um, I use them because I'm able to share uh, my data or part of my data with other people. Yeah. And, um, do you have an option for that in, in, your, in your plan? Yeah, so um, in, as in the LibriVox example shown, we, um, for that, we use, uh, we use Etherpad, and Etherpad has integrated uh, sharing capabilities, for instance, using WebSockets. So there, we need the temporary centralized WebSocket hub, so to say, to exchange the, the updates, right? But uh, that's only temporary. Um, as long as the people are on it, but it will be eventually synced to that, the person's remote storage who initially opened the opened the document. But, and, uh, yes. but you have to um, initialize the contact, so you don't um, you cannot share this document. Someone else later uh, opened that document from the cloud to change something, and um, you come back an hour later and see the changes. Yeah, ideally that, that's possible, yeah. Um, it's, at the moment it's, it's a bit limited because we base it on, we base it on other pad and we're currently working on the, on the exact um, how, how the public aspect works. So ideally, I mean for instance, you maybe know it with Diaspora, they, they use kind of similar things with their decentralized approach and you just need to know uh, the address, like the user address of that other person. And um, so there, it's easy to, to share that document with someone. And we have a, a, some apps, uh, one contact app, one contact and messaging app, and one app called Instagram, which is an unhosted Instagram, uh, which plays with uh, sharing and um, checks out how, how we do comments, uh, where to store the comments, um, and how to link it to the photo, for instance. And yeah, that's at the moment uh, in, in the works. So if you're interested in that, then please uh, join the channel and help us. Any other questions? You can also feel free to ask me later uh, over your own. Okay, um, how do you make sure that the app I'm authorizing is actually the app I think I am authorizing? Good question. So, um, I didn't, I didn't uh, mention it in the, in the talk because um, it's, uh, it's a bit more technical and uh, we thought about a system that we call AppTorrent where basically, because the app are, is all client-side or the apps are all client-side, it's all HTML, JavaScript and CSS, um, we thought about something, a system where you can scrape the whole app, 
package it into a, uh, into a, a JSON object or into a package, hash it, like hash the source code, and then even store it on your remote storage, and then use it from there, because it's all static. So we call it AppTorrent because you share the app just like you would share, I don't know, any, any kind of data, any music file, any, any application, right? Um, people use, use uh, BitTorrent for, um, for uh, desktop applications, so there's a, a torrent uh, way to do it for web applications as well. So there, um, you, have a, you have a app hashed, and then you're able to say, well, I'm an experienced programmer, I'll, I'll look through the source code, and um, if there's nothing wrong with it, if there's no tracking, if there's no uh, whatever malicious code, then I'll sign off the app uh, and say that app with that hash is fine. So that way you, you're able to ensure the integrity of an app, and at the same time, um, there will be no single point of failure for the app, so there will be no single instance where that app is hosted, because it's not hosted, it's unhosted. So you're trying to make a web of trust for apps? That would be an option, yeah. We, we didn't work on it yet, we kind of, um, we have it floating around, but we decided that the world is not ready for it yet. <laughs> but if, you, if, you, if you're interested in that, then please, uh, we, we would love to have you on the movement. I have a question. Uh, uh, I have played along with message queues uh, in those days, and uh, so much of one part, and message queues uh, be uh, all the fun side. Uh, do you have the uh, implements in this direction? With, with message queues or? Message queues, yeah. You are a partner for what's up with this direction? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I think we want to do something with web sockets. Um, I'm not doing that much of the technical part, but um, yeah, you should come to the IRC channel to ask where we're uh, basically around all the time and there you can ask it. Cool. Any more questions? We have stickers, by the way, right? Yeah. <laughs> Unhosted stickers. We have uh, JS stickers. And we also have HTML5 pirate ship stickers. So yeah, that'll be around for you, you can grab one. <laughs>